Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I am Olivia Spate, originally from Waterford, Wisconsin. I'm an incoming junior in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences with a major in Dairy Science and Life Sciences Communication with a certificate in Agricultural Business Management. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Director Mark Stevenson and Associate Director Jenny Vanderlyn from the Center for Dairy Profitability. Mark is an agricultural economist whose area of specialty is dairy markets and policy. He conducts and coordinates research and outreach activities related to the dairy industry and is involved in applied research at the firm level, including milk assembly costs, processing costs, and efficiencies. He is also active in sector level performance, including dairy policy and price forecasting. Jenny has over 22 years of experience with farm financial management programs and software. In her current position, she collaborates, in collaborates with colleagues to develop and coordinate courses, conferences, and educational programs in the areas of financial management and record keeping. Jenny coordinates with the Heart of the Farm Women in Agriculture program and maintains the center's financial database. The Center for Dairy Profitability, or CDP, works in several different areas of farm management and planning with an emphasis placed on the financial and human capital side of the business. The center's tagline is better planning, better decisions, and it summarizes the resources the CDP aims to provide for Wisconsin dairy farmers. Please welcome Dr. Mark Stephenson and Jenny Vanderlyn. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. Yeah. You know, we thought maybe since June is dairy month that we might uh, spend just a little bit of time and talk about dairy in Wisconsin. You know, it's, I think we take it for granted that it's always been here, but it hasn't. Uh, in point of fact, dairy has had quite an evolution to actually get here um, to uh, the state of Wisconsin. And I thought maybe to, to talk about that just a little bit, I'm going to go back in time. Many of you may have read um, to your children or when you were young, the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, you know, Little House on the Prairie series. And the first of those books was Little House in the Big Woods. And that little house in the big woods was here in Wisconsin. The big woods was up in uh, Pepin, Wisconsin. And in fact, they have a, uh, a log cabin there that is supposed to be a replica of the log cabin that Laura was born in and spent her early formative years there. Um, this was not a dairy state at that point in time. And in fact, in the big woods that they talk about, uh, Laura Ingalls' pa, had quite a few adventures, including being chased by a panther um, during that period of time. It's pretty hard for us to imagine that that was the case, but the Big Woods was cleared and became the agricultural land that we uh, see here in the state today. One of her other books, Farmer Boy, was about uh, the person who became her husband. And um, the, he grew up actually on a, on a farm in New York. And that farm was a fairly traditional farm of the time, which had uh, dairy cows on it as well. The picture of Farmer Boy on this book is showing you um, Almanzo Wilder training his uh, two yoked calves uh, so that they could become uh, animals for pulling. Now, it, it's an interesting thing, but at that point in time, uh, New York was the settled land and the established area and Wisconsin was really quite literally the wilderness. But I wanna at least show you in the US what had happened over this time period. And I'm gonna talk about three different states just a little bit. I'm gonna start over here on that Eastern seaboard of the US. That's where dairy first got its toehold, but that was also because that's where the primary population of the United States was located along that Eastern seaboard. And I've got a star on the state of New York where our story begins. And that farm that Almanzo Wilder grew up on, I'm calling was diverse um, because they had not only dairy cows, they had sheep, they had pigs, they uh, boiled maple syrup. Uh, they did just a variety of things, which was common for farms of that time period. And that kind of farm supplied the milk and dairy products to the population centers in New York and Boston and up and down that Eastern seaboard. 
But eventually the population grew to a point that it couldn't be sustained by the dairy in the region. Milk was actually being shipped as much as 400 miles by train um, in the early days, uh, which would have been the mid 1800s, I guess, during that time period. And since we couldn't supply enough, we had to look further to the West. And as we looked further to the West, um, we got into this area of the upper Midwest that I'm calling specialized dairy, but traditional dairy. When I said traditional in both cases, it's because they raised all the feed needed for the animals. And that was true on the East Coast, and that was true here in the upper Midwest. But at that time, Wisconsin was not a big dairy state. It was actually Iowa that was the number two dairy state in the country, New York being number one. And Wisconsin at that time was known as a wheat producing state. They grew a tremendous amount of wheat, even by today's standards. And they grew wheat upon wheat upon wheat um, year after year in those fields. And they began to suffer some of the uh, diseases um, that were pre uh, prevalent for that kind of monoculture. And as the wheat crops began to fail, there was a journalist in the region who began to proclaim that we needed to give something back to the land. And to him, that was an animal agriculture, and that meant dairy. And uh, the dairy came in up out of Iowa into West, the state of Wisconsin and began to mushroom, which is why we see still a lot of those hip roof red barns around the state. They were all built within a 30 or 40 year time span. Um, so dairy happened here pretty quickly. The diverse traditional dairy farms of New York at that time had you know, a small flock of uh, sheep and a few pigs and chickens and maybe three, four, five cows, something like that. When dairy came into Wisconsin, they built specialized dairies uh, that did only uh, milk production or largely milk production, maybe 15 to 20 cows. That was a huge dairy at that point in time. Uh, so that was specialized. Later on, dairy began to develop in the far west. As you can see, there's a big mountain range between uh, the central part of the country and the far west. And as California's population grew, um, it needed to have more milk and dairy products, which really couldn't effectively be shipped over those mountains at the time. And so California had to grow its own dairy region kind of late in the early 1900s. Uh, to mid 1900s. So they got started later. They built a different kind of dairy system and I'm calling that an intensive dairy system. It was large uh, dairy farms in comparison to what uh, we have in the upper Midwest. And they oftentimes didn't raise their own feed. They purchased feed and brought that in to the specialized dairy farm. So as those three states, um, New York, the largest uh, state going all the way back there to the early 1900s was the biggest milk producing state. Wisconsin uh, was number two in the early um, 1900s, but surpassed New York very quickly. And that's the red line that we see there. This is total milk production. Uh, we didn't even record California prior to that, but you can see that California got started and by the mid 1970s, their milk production shot off in a very rapid expansion past not only New York, but also past uh, Wisconsin in the 1990s or surpassed Wisconsin as of the first largest milk producing state. If you take a look around the country, this is a map um, that I put together that shows you the milk surplus and deficit regions. So if you're looking at reds, darker shades of reds, that means that you don't even come close to producing the amount of milk and dairy products needed. If you're some shade of green, it means that you produce a little bit more than is needed locally. And then that surplus can be shipped or sent um, further to areas that are deficit. You'll see that the state of Wisconsin is a big surplus milk producing state. We produce quite a bit more than is needed but it's a good thing that we do because that whole Eastern seaboard and especially down through the Southeast is deficit. And so we ship um, dairy products long distances. California is a little bit of a different story. 
they have a big um, surplus region of the state. They also have some very large population centers in Los Angeles and San Francisco, uh, but they are net surplus for sure in terms of milk production. But if you think about it, milk itself is really expensive to ship any long distance. Um, beverage milk, raw milk is about 86% um, water or moisture and moving that much fluid down the road is expensive. So we have a tendency to make concentrated dairy products, nutrient dense products and ship those things longer distances. For Wisconsin, that product has been cheese and we've made a lot of cheese over the years. Let's take a look at the regions though. Um, this graph is showing you over time since uh, the year 2000, um, the surplus or deficit by regions. In the very bottom there, you notice that trending downward is the southeastern part of the United States. It may not mean too much to you, from, but uh, in terms of numbers, that region is 50 billion pounds of milk net deficit. That's a lot of dairy product that has to come long distances. That red line that's kind of flat um, is showing you mild deficit. That's the whole northeastern part of the country. And if you look at the other two lines, uh, the green line is the western region of the United States. And that uh, bluish colored line is the upper Midwest area, both surplus and becoming more surplus over time. So our dairy tends to be concentrating into some regions of the country and shrinking or leaving other regions of the country. There's a good reason for that. Here's a, a chart that's showing you US licensed dairy herds. Um, if you go back just to 2002, we had about 75,000 dairy farms in this country. And today there's barely 30,000 dairy farms. So we've been losing dairy farms at a fairly stable pace over a long period of time. Um, that's because farms have become larger, although fewer in number. If you take a look here at this chart, this is showing you the growth in milk production by herd size categories. That very thin light blue line down at the bottom, which you may not be able to see, are relatively small farms, less than 30 cows. That was a common farm size back in the early 1900s. Today, we don't see very many farms that size. And you can see the larger herd sizes as you keep going up the graph. Now, the only two categories of farm size that are actually growing in milk production is that brown band and that uh, sage green band up at the top. Those represent um, herds that are at least 1,000 cows in size or larger. All the rest of the herd sizes are um, shrinking in terms of their contribution to total milk production in the US. So it's very much a consolidation, but this has been happening since the 1930s. That's when we peaked in dairy farm numbers with about 3 million dairy farms in the US. And today, as I said, we have about 30,000. So quite a bit of concentration. We've had improved efficiency on dairy cows. This is the pounds of milk that a dairy cow in the US is producing. This is a remarkably stable line. Usually we see fluctuations around a trend, but this has very little fluctuation. It's almost a straight graphic. Today's dairy cow is producing about 25,000 pounds of milk per cow per year. Um, and that increases at a very stable rate. This is the US average. The next graph I'll show you will be Wisconsin's average milk production per cow. This also is quite a stable trend, but you'll notice here that there's actually a bit of a bend in that, that this is increasing at a more rapid rate over the last several years, and a good reason for that. When you think about a dairy cow producing as much milk as they do today, that's both because they're genetically superior animals than they were decades ago, but we also know more about better feeding and management of those dairy cows. 
But a high producing dairy cow is also much like a, a high performing athlete that they generate quite a bit of body heat that has to be dissipated for that animal to stay comfortable. And these high producing dairy cows just can't do this in hot, humid climates like we have in the Southeast, for example, or the Southern part of the US. If it's hot but dry, dairy cows can tolerate that for a period of time, but dairy cows actually like a cooler climate. And that describes very well what Wisconsin has. We have a cooler climate that produces high quality crops to feed the dairy cow. It's an ideal um, agronomic resource uh, for milk production. That doesn't mean that we haven't had some problems though. Um, dairy cows uh, produce the milk and we sell it. And the marketplace for milk is showing you in this graphic what kind of prices farms receive. Now we usually denominate or sell milk in terms of 100 pound units. So these prices are per 100 weight of milk. And you'll notice that there's been a great deal of up like we had in 2014 year and quite a, a serious amount of down. A good example would have been in April here of last year of uh, our <clears throat> pandemic, prices collapsed. They responded, they've gone back up, they've come down, they've gone back up, they've come down again. And so it's been a real roller coaster ride for dairy farmers. This makes it hard to plan for businesses and difficult for farms to manage that risk, but it is possible. You'll notice in this particular slide, this is showing you Wisconsin dairy farm attrition. We lose dairy farms. That's an old story. Um, as farms get larger, we have fewer of them. And um, that green line in the bottom is showing you 2006. Pretty typical for Wisconsin to lose about 4% of their dairy farms a year. As we were going through a period of rather sustained lower milk prices, um, in 2017, that began to trend upward. That continued through 2018 and 19. And at the end of 2019, we were losing as many as 10% of our dairy herds um, on an annualized basis. That came back down in 2020. And in 2021, it's been stable around the 5% range but we still aren't back to the uh, lower level of losses we've had. So dairy farm loss has been a bit of a problem for folks um, as they've struggled with financial issues. And yet Wisconsin milk production continues to climb. Our state had a goal oh, a decade or so ago that we began to talk about, we want to, to produce 30 billion pounds of milk annually by the year 2020 was our goal. So it was 30 by 20 was the uh, slogan we had. As you can see, we achieved that actually back in 2016. So we hit 30 billion pounds early um, on that goal. And we continue to increase milk production at a somewhat slower rate now. This again was that surplus deficit map. And as we've pointed out before, uh, the surplus regions tend to produce nutrient dense products. And for Wisconsin, that's been cheese. This last graphic that I wanted to show you is, is just showing you how we are the number one cheese producing state in the country. We are the number two milk producing state, but almost all of our milk goes into the production of cheese. And increasingly, it's been specialty cheeses in this state. Uh, we produce more than 3 billion pounds of cheese a year. Um, so it's, it's a lot of cheese production, and that's been increasing over time. And uh, with that, I think maybe uh, Jenny can talk a little bit about what the center does to help our Wisconsin dairy producers um, become more profitable. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, I thought, as Mark did a little bit of a history, I thought I would start by telling the history of the, uh, of the center, which um, started in 1988 and was a recommendation of the then Wisconsin Dairy Task Force 1995. They had conducted a pretty comprehensive study on working with the dairy farmers and letting them become um, more profitable and viability, their viability. 
So the center came about and our mission at that time and still is, was to develop, coordinate and deliver an effective interdisciplinary educational and applied research to dairy farmers and the dairy industry service providers. And then it was supposed to result in the sustainable, profitable decisions um, for a healthy, progressive dairy industry. So back then, we only there was, um, I think, just one director and a couple of other specialists. And it and we've migrated through throughout the years to go across um, two divisions: UW System and UW Extension, which as of 2018 has become one system um, but we also go across three different campuses that would be uw madison uw platteville and uw river falls and across three different um, departments that would be dairy science egg and applied economics and biological engineering systems so you can see by this venn this venn diagram we there's a there's three up on the top there are three no, four, excuse me, academic staff um, members of the center, three of which are full time on the University of Madison campus. One is 50% faculty at UW Platteville. We also have three faculty affiliates that um, overlap with the departments that I mentioned dairy science and egg economics, and then biological systems. And we also have an academic staff faculty or affiliate from UW Extension. So this is this is our group. Um, and all of us kind of work over these major programs and activities. There's dairy markets and policies and Mark just kind of went over a little bit of what he does under under that section. Economics of dairy and farm processing, farm succession, mental health and stress management, and then management information systems and dairy and farm management education programs. So we work across all of these in um, farm management and planning with the, that emphasis, as Olivia had pointed out, a financial and the human capital of the farm business. And also, as Mark had indicated, the evolution of dairy has changed over the years and the CDP has had to kind of move and reconsider our mission and some of the educational programs and activities that we do do. But basically these are the, the main ones that we have kind of moved and migrated towards and, and what we do at this point. Um, going, our, our tagline is like the dairy or better planning, better decisions. So all of these kind of following that sequence would fit into the tagline. Um, so I'm going to go through each one of the, our major programs and activities. We'll start with the dairy markets and policies, which Mark's already gone through. I don't know, Mark, if you want to say anything about anything more. Well, not particularly. Milk pricing is complex um, and is partially regulated uh, by the federal government, although they're searching for market prices, not specifically the price. Um, we have a lot of market volatility they pointed out, and we use risk management to try to help farmers uh, manage that risk. Um, dairy policy is changing, uh, discussions at the state level and at the federal level, uh, global trade in dairy products. We export about 18% of our milk supply now. So this is significant by export. I don't mean just out of Wisconsin, I mean out of the country. Um, we're the world's third largest exporter of dairy products. And <clears throat> so all of those things and the changing uh, patterns of milk production are important considerations about where things go. That's part of what I do. Okay. The next one would be the economics of, of dairy. And as I had mentioned, historically, one of the main topics that the Center for Dairy Profitability what was to do was to work with that fin financial management in working with um, kind of the, the financial position, which would be the strength of the farm, and then the financial profitability or the performance of the farm. And by ways of doing that, we have a number of programs that work with the financial model of continuum of working with financial records, which would move on to your financial statements, 
uh, like the balance sheet, the income statement, statement of cash flows. And then the main one on where the better planning, better decisions is, is how do you take all of that financial information and make a better decision on moving forward with your farm business? We do that with using comparison of benchmark, financial benchmarks through the Wisconsin dairy systems. And we also, we can do that um, to a historical trend within the individual farm, or they can actually look at their farm, kind of compare it to other farms within the business of similar size and um, financial capacity. That would be that, and then with the farm business financial management, we have a number of projects and programs that we teach throughout the state, mm -hmm. along with the county educators. So farm succession is another one that we do. Succession planning is about preserving that farm business for their heirs to take over. It's a process of part passing all of the farm into the next generation as smoothly and as quickly as possible in some cases. And the CDP does different programs of farm succession on transition plans, how to build that plan, um, business strategies, personal and business goals, estate planning. Usually we like to meet uh, essentially with all family partners and then just kind of see where some of their goals are, especially the younger generation coming in and working with the older generation. So again, it can be just as smooth and as successful as it possibly can be. These programs are um, given to farmers, and but also egg professionals who are working with farmers. That would be maybe an egg lender or another um, farm business consultant. The mental health and stress management is something that we've been working with the last few years. Um, as Mark has already noticed, the dairy industry has involved in a lot of the different um, low prices and uncertainty of the dairy farms within Wisconsin have led to an increase in mental health issues and also suicidal risk. And in just last year, the CDP and the Department of Ag, the um, and Trade and Consumer Protection partnered up and got a grant funding from the National Institute of Food, was it NIFA? Food. Oh. Institute of Food and Agriculture. Food and Ag, yeah. And it was through, through their um, farm and risk stress management grant funding. And we, all, we got some funding for that to develop training and a curriculum that would help farmers and aid professionals, but also the mental health and first aid trainers in all of the suicidal and farm management and strategic planning tools. There will be a curriculum that will be coming out hopefully within the next year or two to train all of these different aspects, giving the mental health and first aid trainers a little bit more of a farming background and vice versa, the farming backgrounds, a little bit more information on that financial or the, the mental health and first aid. So that's, that's a major thing that we're all working on this year and it will be a three-year grant moving forward. So with all the different programs and activities we have, we have to have some kind of a venue to let all of this training out. One of the major ones that we work with is the Heart of the Farm Women in Agriculture. We've been doing um, programs for women in ag for about, I don't know, the last 20 years, I think. And we do that in one day conferences. And just this last year with COVID, we do online coffee chats. The one day conferences are worked on through, we, I, I coordinate with county educators and we put on a one day conference for the women on a very varied topics. It just kind of depends what seems to be the highlight of that year or that season. And the coffee chats, we are doing it on the second Mondays of every single month. And we just started up our summer series um, yesterday morning with, um, highlighting June Dairy Month and a sixth generation farm store that was there. The Management Assessment Center is something that we've put together through the county educators within Extension 2. And we kind of assess the management skills and attributes that it takes to run the dairy farm because most of them, as going back to the farm succession, might have kind of just inherited something, but they don't know how to manage. And a lot of them 
the, the bigger they get, as Mark pointed out, they need to have more employees on the farm. And so we just kind of assess those management skills. And then the land values, we take information from um, the Department of Revenue and we've got a couple of papers coming out very recently on those land values and the people can use them to kind of um, figure out land rent values or land rent rates throughout the, the state. And then the management information centers, our, our systems, excuse me, our, our biggest one is Farm Bench. It used to be called AGFA and it's a financial, well, real-time financial analysis and benchmarking systems. We have two farm associations who are made in Wisconsin, who are major contributors to the financial data. And you can go on, anybody can use it on our system and get those benchmarking, again, doing a historical trend of their own farm or they can actually do it against the farms within Wisconsin. The other thing that we have is an agricultural accounting and record keeping software and our in-house one is Ames. And then I also do a lot of training on QuickBooks because a lot of farmers across the state have been using that. So those are the two systems that the center actually has and the training that we offer to, for producers. On our website, you'll find a number of different resources where you'll have some cash flow budgeting that people can have, papers and presentations on all of the programs that we're offering done by all of our um, staff members and faculty affiliates, decision making tools, that would be a cash flow tool, a performa tool, and then the training that when we're offering training on the various um, management assistant systems that we have financial analysis, farm succession consulting, and as I mentioned, the mental health and stress education program will be also listed there. So with that, I think we turn it over to Fran. Hi, Mark and Jenny, thanks so much. Hello everybody, Fran Paleo Moyer, Badger Talks producer. Uh, boy, you guys really are an amazing support for for the dairy farmers of our state. Thank you so much for all of your great work. Uh, feel free to post your questions in the chat on Facebook and YouTube and I'm happy to pose those uh, questions to Mark and Jenny for you. So um, I have a question actually, I think for Mark, uh, relating to the slide that you had on the attrition of dairy farms and that 2020 line you saw just kind of plummet uh, over the course of that year. And I don't think you really mentioned COVID and like where the pandemic landed and how did that impact dairy farms? Can you speak a little bit to that? Oh, happy to. Um, 2020 was for everybody a crazy year. Um, for dairy farms, it was, uh, you know, uh, an unparalleled year for us. The reason was that um, in April, you know, when we had our safer at home um, sort of things going on, this meant that overnight we stopped going out to restaurants. We weren't serving food through schools or other institutions. Out of home eating constitutes half of dairy product consumption, a little more than half. And that just collapsed overnight. And, you know, honestly, the cows never got the memo. And that's a problem, you know, when, when uh, we don't need as much milk um, immediately, uh, we were in panic mode. Our cheesemakers stepped up. They produced product that they didn't have a customer for um, simply to help continue to move that milk. And um, that was a good thing. But we also had a little bit of milk that had to be dumped. We had cows that had to be culled very quickly. We had some farms that chose to simply say, this is time for me. I, you know, I'm at a life stage and I can't put up with this and you know, I'll sell my farm. So we did cut back milk production. And then we had pandemic programs that stepped into place like the farm to family food boxes uh, that had dairy products in them. And overnight there was this whole new demand that was taking place. Many people food insecure and receiving um, groceries in lines. Um, and our milk prices bounced from the bottom. They doubled in a six week time period 
Um, so it was really a very incredible time period. But overall, the average milk price for the year was not bad. And there were some direct government payments that went to farms to help stabilize them in a very volatile year. Um, those payments came through the coronavirus, coronavirus uh, food assistance program. And uh, that helped to stop or stem the loss of dairy farms. So a very volatile year, not unlike so many other industries, it sounds like. Uh, Jenny, so you were mentioning these coffee chats and you, my ears really perked up when you said six generations. On yeah, the most recent one we had was Weber Farms up, from, up in Marshfield and it's called Weber's Farm Store and we highlighted that farm store and it's six generations. That's and she amazing. told a really great story about how they used to deliver milk in bottles with a horse and buggy. So, oh, <laughs> wow. So tell me, that was a coffee chat then? That was, are those available? Are those recorded for people to see later or do you just have to catch those? In no, they, they are recorded. We have a Heart of the Farm website and also a Facebook page. And we're just in the process of transcribing it right now. It should be up on the, the website. I would say by the end of the month, uh, I mean, excuse me, the end of the week. And then all of the ones that we did last, last, from last fall through early spring are up there as well. Okay, great, good to know. Uh, so I, I have a question for you all. If you could look into a crystal ball and look forward a hundred years from now, um, what is your prediction of where dairy will be um, for people? And then what is your hopes for that? Well, I'll kind of go back to um, a couple of those slides when I said that dairy cows don't, we still produce milk, by the way, in all 50 states, not very much in some. In fact, there's like one farm in two of our states. Um, so it's, it's getting pretty thin. Um, but in general, these higher producing dairy cows are increasingly uh, in growth mode in the uh, northern tier of states. When you see a state like Idaho, it's dry, but relatively cool through the winters and the summers aren't too bad. Um, all the way through the uh, East Coast, um, the northern tier of states are where we've seen more recent growth in milk production occurring. And, you know, W.D. Horde uh, as governor and before that, um, as a author, um, exhorted people to begin to bring dairy cows into the state because he thought it made a lot of sense. And it still does today. The agronomic resources of this land are probably best used for supporting a dairy cow and producing milk. I, I think it's got a bright future. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. Jenny and Mark, thanks so much for joining us today. And uh, we really appreciate you sharing all of this really valuable information for our Wisconsin dairy farmers. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Great. Everybody, please tune in next week. We're going to be continuing to celebrate uh, June Dairy Month. We're going to be talking to John Lucy, who's the director for the Center of Dairy Research. And he's going to be exploring how Wisconsin became one of the world's leaders in cheese production and how the University of Wisconsin has played a role in that transformation. And the fun will continue with June Dairy Month. On June 29th, we're going to be talking to the Dairyland Initiative, who is going to be talking about barns that are created for cow comfort. Uh, please visit badgertalks.wis.edu, where you can see our upcoming schedule of live talks. You can sign up for our email list. Please consider a donation to Badger Talks Live. We are a grant supported entity. Uh, and also sign up to host your own speaker. We have about 400 faculty and staff that are ready and willing to give talks around the state. Thanks for tuning in everybody. We'll see you next week.